dedicated to the strength of the nation. Proudly, we hail. Yes, proudly we hail, starring Anne Blythe in There's No Escape, the United States Army and United States Air Force presentation. And now here is our producer, the well-known Hollywood showman, C.P. McGregor. Thank you, thank you, and greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to your theater of stars, where each week the outstanding stars of motion pictures join us for your entertainment in plays we know you'll enjoy. Beautiful, talented Anne Blythe is our star. In the title of our story of mystery and suspense, There's No Escape. In just a moment, we'll have the curtain for Act One. Here now, with a brief but important message, is our announcer, Wendell Niles. Only the best can be aviation cadets. And now because your United States Air Force is planning for the future and wants the best young men, special consideration is being given to this year's college graduates who want careers as leaders in aviation. As officers in your United States Air Force, if you're graduating this June, apply now for aviation cadet training. As a college graduate, your application will be rushed so that you can begin training as soon as you graduate. Visit your U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force recruiting station today to make certain you're accepted for one of this summer's aviation cadet classes. Remember, only the best can be aviation cadets. And now, once again, our producer. The curtain rises on Act One of There's No Escape, starring Anne Blythe as Martha Morgan. In a lonely hilltop farmhouse, a short three hours drive from New York City, Martha Morgan, by the light of a single dim bulb, is writing a farewell note to her fiancé, Jim Harris. Jim. Jim, my dearest. I want to tell you again how much I love you. Within an hour, I'll be dead. Murdered. And there's no escape. Nothing anyone can do. My only purpose in writing this note is the hope that you or, or Rachel Hawkins or someone will find it and use the evidence I'm leaving to convict this killer. I'm locked in a windowless storage closet across the hall from Mother's bedroom. It doesn't seem possible that just three days ago we were together in my apartment planning our future. We'll have a place in Connecticut, a half dozen kids. Well, how's that sound to you so far? Oh, it sounds wonderful, Jim, only don't you think we should be married first? Well, it might keep the neighbors from talking. <laughs> I'll tell you what we'll do. Just as soon as I get back from this trip, we'll drive up to your mother's farm, we'll talk it over with her, and we'll set the date. Oh, she'll like that. How long do you expect to be away? Well, just a couple of days, three at the most. Oh, I wish we had time to drive up and see mother before you leave. According to her letter, she hasn't been herself lately. Well, I'd like to, darling, but I'm afraid I can't. Oh, I know it's impossible. Why, why you should be leaving for the station now. What? Oh, gosh, I didn't realize it was so late. You know, I think we're in love. Oh, hurry back, darling. I'll be waiting. Less than an hour after you left, I got a wire telling me that Mother had died. Naturally, I took the first train up here, and my stepfather, Walter Burke, met me at the station and drove me out to the house. He wouldn't discuss Mother's death until after he'd had a drink and we were comfortably seated in the living room. There can be no mistake, Martha. The result of the autopsy was a verdict of suicide from an overdose of sedatives. I just can't believe it, Walter. Why should Mother do anything like that? She never had any serious illness. She was happily married, had plenty of money. You're thinking of your mother as she was when you last saw her, Martha. You didn't see her after she changed. Changed? Perhaps you'll understand if you let me tell this from the beginning. Oh, I want you to, Walter. 
Unfortunately, I don't have your father's business ability. During the years your mother and I were married, I made several mistakes in my investments. Finally, about a month ago, I was forced to tell your mother that except for this farm and a few securities in your name, there was nothing left. I know, but... The shock of that financial loss was more than her mind could stand. She became, by turns, listless, moody, and extremely eccentric. It was quite pitiful. Poor mother. Yes. Even our old Rachel couldn't stand it and, and left. In time, I was forced to have the phone taken out because she was calling everyone in the village and making wild, erratic statements to the point where the village schoolboys began coming out here to throw stones at the house. I wondered at the broken window. That happened last night. Why didn't you let me know about Mother immediately? Because at first I had hopes it would be a temporary thing. That the sedative she was taking would accomplish their purpose. That she would forget the money. And no one would ever need know. After Mother's funeral, I started to clean up the house beginning in the storage closet across the hall from her bedroom, the one in which I'm now held prisoner. It was filled with the sentimental accumulations of 30 years, including my bronze baby shoes. For years, Mother and I had left notes for each other in those old toddlers, and as I picked them up, automatically, almost unconsciously, I ran my hands into them and found a note. Dearest Martha, Mother had written. I hope you never find yourself living in fear as I am. It's a horrible feeling, especially when you fear someone you love, as I fear water. There's nothing tangible, no overt act to which I can point, yet whenever he touches me, I feel that death is brushing my shoulder. It's been like that ever since I found out about the money. And what are you reading? <gasps> Walter, where did you come from? What are you reading? What? It's a note from Mother. I found it in my baby shoes. May I see it, please? Why, yes, of course. Thank you. How much of this had you read? Why, why, most of it, I guess. To where she mentioned finding out about the money. Well, that should convince you. There had been any doubt in your mind? Doubt of what? that she was insane. Can you imagine anyone living in fear of me? Why, it doesn't seem very reasonable. Thank you, my dear. May I have the note back? I wasn't quite finished. All she said after that was that she loved you. Oh, don't burn it, please. I wanted to keep it. <laughs> it could only make you unhappy, my dear. Uh, let's go downstairs and try to forget all this unpleasantness. We can clean this place tomorrow, together. After Walter burned the note for Mother, I felt the same fearful nervous sensation she had described. Intangible but terribly real. And I had to get out of the house, away from him. I told him I had to go to the village to get some things I'd forgotten in my rush to reach Mother. Then he wanted to drive me, but... I insisted that I needed the walk and hurried on. When I reached the village, I went directly to Dr. Higgins' office. He'd been our family physician for years, and I wanted him to tell me how Mother could have broken down so completely in such a short space of time. Uh, sit down, Martha. Thank you, Dr. Higgins. Your mother's passing was a great shock to me, my dear. Why would she do such a thing, Doctor? I don't know. No one does. Your mother probably felt that she had a very good reason. I can't think of any other explanation. Was this mental illness of mother's a gradual thing, Doctor, or did it strike her suddenly? I understand it's been developing for about a month. Of course, all I know is hearsay. Hearsay? Weren't you treating her, Dr. Higgins? Oh, no. I haven't seen your mother in months. As a matter of fact, after hearing of her illness, I stopped by to volunteer my services and... Your stepfather very bluntly told me he didn't need a country. Quack, I believe, is the word he used. 
Oh, I can't imagine Mother permitting that. From what I've heard, your mother didn't have much to say about that or anything else. Oh? Well, what doctor did care for her? I don't know. It's my opinion, though, that he should never have prescribed any sort of sedative for her. She was allergic to even the smallest dose. I see. Her husband should have known that. Yes. Yes, he should, shouldn't he? Are you ill, Martha? No. No, I'm not ill, Dr. Higgins. I... I just remembered something. Please excuse me. After talking with Dr. Higgins, my intangible fear of Walter began to take real form. A terrible form which grew to monstrous proportions after I met Rachel in the general store. I heard you was in town, Martha. Did uh, Jim come up with you? No, Rachel. He was out of town on a business trip when I got the news. Oh, nice boy. When are you going to marry him? We were planning to drive up and talk it over with Mother this weekend, and then... Oh. He's still working at the same place? Yes. Good. I've been meaning to drop him a note and ask him and you to come up here and look into things ever since Mr. Burke fired me. I just didn't get around to it. Did you say Mr. Burke fired you, Rachel? Well, you don't think I'd have left your mother for any other reason, do you? Why, no. No, of course not. He's been with Mother ever since I can remember. I reckon that's why he fired me. Though the excuse was that your mother needed a trained nurse. <laughs> Nobody ever saw one, though. I wish you'd stayed, Rachel. Well, so do I now. She tried to call me once on the phone, but I was out. Didn't you call back? Certainly. But the first time, Mr. Burke said she was sleeping, and the next time, the phone had been disconnected. And when I went out to the house, well, he wouldn't let me see her. And you never saw her again? Never. <clears throat> you and Jim going to live up here after you get married? No. We're going to sell the farm. Well, you sure need some cleaning done then. I'll come out tomorrow and help you. Oh, thank you, Rachel. I'll feel better if you're there. Uh, do you want me to go out with you now? No. No, but I would like you to send a wire to Jim for me. I want to get back to the house as soon as possible. Anything I can do to help you? Well, just send the wire to his office. That way he'll get it as soon as he returns. Tell him I need him. And ask him to come up here right away. I'll make it plenty strong. Thank you, Rachel. I'll be expecting you tomorrow. <laughs> You can't possibly get my wire in time. But it was my only hope. My suspicions had become a conviction. Although I lacked conclusive proof, I felt certain that Walter Burke was responsible for Mother's death. His attitude when he found me reading Mother's note. His discharging Rachel when Mother needed her most. And his telling me that she'd quit. His refusal to admit Dr. Higgins into the house. The sedatives... The evidence was all there, but why? Why should he have killed Mother? As I was thinking these things, I saw Walter driving slowly down Main Street, apparently looking for me. So I hurried back to the house to search for an answer. I found it at the bottom of a handkerchief box in Walter's wardrobe. It was a bank book registered in Walter's name. The account hadn't been opened until after Walter married my mother. And it showed deposits which roughly told the amount of money my father had left. There was the motive. Clutching the bank book, I ran downstairs, but I was too late. Just as I reached the front door, I... Where are you going, Martha? Get out of my way. You're not leaving this house. You can't push me. I said you're not leaving this house. We pause briefly from our story, There's No Escape, starring Anne Blythe, to bring you an important message from our government. Ladies and gentlemen, our Army and our Air Force are critically short of physicians and dentists. Over 2,000 volunteers from these two professions are urgently needed today to safeguard and care for the health of the men and women who, as members of the United States Army and United States Air Force, are serving you and me at home and overseas. Young physicians and dentists particularly those who did not serve in the armed services during World War II, have been asked by their government to act now 
to volunteer for duty at once. If you are one of these young physicians or dentists, please write or wire either the Surgeon General of the United States Army or the Air Surgeon of the United States Air Force at once and volunteer your services. If you know one of these young physicians or dentists, please call his attention to this urgent message. Thank you. The curtain rises on Act Two of There's No Escape, starring Anne Blythe as Martha Morgan. When Martha was told that her mother had committed suicide, her first reaction was shock. The shock was soon replaced by suspicion. Suspicion that her stepfather, Walter Burke, was responsible for her mother's death. Suspicion which Martha now knows will result in her own death. Locked in a windowless storage closet, in a lonely hilltop farmhouse which was her mother's home, Martha continues her story. I had the evidence of the bank book and deposit slips in my hand. I ran downstairs, but I was too late. Just as I reached the front door... Where are you going, Martha? Get out of my way. You're not leaving this house. You can't tell I'd me. I'd like to have a little talk with well, you. Well, I don't want to talk with you. Really? Why not? You killed my mother. You appear to be suffering from the same illness she had. Let me give you a sedative. No, thank you. What's the name of the doctor who cared for my mother when she was ill? I... I don't really remember. It was a doctor in the city. He specializes in the care of mental illnesses. Well, if you don't know his name, how were you able to locate him and get him to come up here? As a matter of fact, he didn't come up here. I went to the city, described your mother's symptoms to him, and brought back the medication he prescribed. No doctor would prescribe sedatives without seeing the patient. Now look, Martha, I don't know what the people in the village have been telling you, but I can guess the lines that followed because they all hate me. But if you'll check with the coroner, he'll tell you that your mother's death was a clear case of suicide. Will he also tell me that mother was allergic to even a small dose of sedative? Dr. Higgins will testify to that, and that you knew it. And gave them to her regularly. I don't know what you're talking about. I think you do. After all, my dear, as you yourself pointed out earlier, your mother and I were very happily married. Yet you murdered her. Murdered? There can be no murder without a motive. You had the motive. And I have the proof right here in this bank book. I'm terribly sorry that you found this book, Martha. I can understand that. Can you? then perhaps you can understand that I was equally sorry when your mother found it. What are you going to do? You've left me no choice. If you don't die, I will. And I have much too much to live for. You don't dare kill me. That's where you're mistaken. I don't dare let you live. You don't dare. I think we'd better go upstairs, Martha. Will you go quietly, or must I resort to unpleasant measures? I'll go quietly. Good girl. But don't forget, I'm right behind you. I told you, you don't dare kill me. And if you remember, my answer was that I don't dare let you live. However, it is a matter which requires considerable thought. Your death must appear to be a regrettable accident. And how do you expect to get away with that? That, my dear, is the point which requires the thought. Come along. Where are you taking me? I just want to know that you'll be safe. It may take me a day or two to think of a satisfactory accident for you. It's me, Martha. Rachel Hawkins. Make a sound and I'll kill you right now. What's she doing here? Why, I asked her to come. Well, she'll go away. If she does, she'll be suspicious. I hadn't thought of that. Well, come on. You're going to let me see her? Yes. You're going to tell her that you've changed your mind, that you don't want her out here. Why, I'll tell her nothing of the kind. Oh, yes, you will. I have a gun in my pocket, Martha, and if you don't send Rachel away completely satisfied with your story, I'll shoot you both. Do you think you could get away with that? It's safer than letting her go back to the village and talk. I'll at least have a running start and a chance to get out of the country. Are you going to send her away satisfied? Well? What else can I do? There's no reason why Rachel should die, too. That's very sensible and very loyal. Come on, my dear. And remember, at the first indication that Rachel's suspicious, I'll kill you both. <laughs> <laughs> 
What's come over you, Martha? Not an hour ago, you said you wanted me to help you clean. Now you say you'll do it yourself. Are you sick or something? She's had a very trying day, Rachel. She needs a chance to rest. Is that it, Martha? I guess so, Rachel. Oh, my mind's so confused that... Well, then, why don't you and me take a walk down to the old well? When you was a little girl and wanted to think things out, you used to go down there, remember? Yes. The old rocky well. Well, let's go down there. You'll feel better. Martha really needs to be alone today, Rachel. Uh, why don't you come back tomorrow? You can go to the well then. In, in fact, we'll all go and take a picnic lunch. What do you say, Martha? Yes. Yes, of course. All right, then. I'll be back tomorrow. That is, if you're sure you don't want me to stay. I'm sure, Rachel. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is wonderful. I didn't realize that we were quite that funny. Oh, but you are. In the first place, I don't have a gun. In the second place, you established that your mind was confused, and <laughs> you and Rachel supplied the perfect accident. How? How? What did we say? The old rocky well, where you spent so many hours as a little girl when you wanted to think things out. Well, my dear, it'll be dark in another four or five hours. And tomorrow, when Rachel arrives, we'll both be shocked to discover that sometime during the night, you went to the well, stumbled, hit your head on a rock, and drowned. <laughs> All the evidence is here, Jim. My last hope and prayer will be that you find this letter. Within a few minutes, as soon as he thinks it's safe, he'll be coming upstairs. He's coming now, Jim. I can hear his feet on the stair. He's at the top of the stair now. I'll hide this note before he sees it. It's time, Martha. Please, Walter. Please. I'm sorry. It's nothing personal. Simply self-defense. Oh, what was that? A window. Those kids from the village have broken another window. Help! Help me! Oh, let me go. Don't try anything like that again. I'll be back for you as soon as I get rid of those kids. Oh. You brush get away from here and stay away. If I ever catch you... Oh, dear God. Oh, dear God, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. <laughs> Martha, Martha. It's me, dearest. Jim. Jim. How did you get here? Rachel telephoned me after you sent her away. She knew there was something terribly wrong. But, but Walter, where is he? Downstairs with Rachel. And she has the biggest shotgun I ever saw. But how? How? I... Rachel remembered that Walter went wild when the kids broke a window, so she threw a rock and he charged out and ran into my left hook. Well, he won't wake up for some time. He killed Mother, Jim. He was going to kill me. There's nothing to worry about now, darling. Oh, Jim. I thought I'd never see you again. I'll never leave you again. Please don't. Take me in your arms and hold me tight. So there can be no escape. <laughs> The curtain falls in the final act of There's No Escape. Our star, Anne Blythe, will return for a curtain call after this important message from Wendell Niles. This is important. This is urgent. Over 2,000 young physicians and dentists are needed as volunteers at once 
for service in the United States Army or United States Air Force. These physicians and dentists are required to safeguard the health of the men and women who are serving our country in the armed services. If you are a physician or a dentist, you are needed now. Write or wire the Surgeon General of the United States Army or the Air Surgeon of the United States Air Force at once, volunteering for active duty. Let me repeat that. Write or wire the Surgeon General of the United States Army or the Air Surgeon of the United States Air Force today. Or see your local U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force recruiting station. Now back at the microphone, our star, Ann Blythe, and our producer. Welcome back to Proudly We Hail, Ann. It's good to have you with us again. Well, it's good to be back with you. Oh, my, how time flies. It must have been a hundred shows ago since I was here. Ninety-nine, to be exact. <laughs> that sounds like a golf score. And by the way, how is your golf these days? Well, maybe under a hundred. <laughs> I'm not ready for you at Lakeside yet. I'm still working on my hitting power. Of course, you experts never worry about things like that. I'm the club expert in being too close to the ball after I hit it. <laughs> <laughs> but, Anne, I want to ask you about your start in pictures. Well, before signing with Universal International, I was in the stage play of Watch on the Rhine with Paul Lucas, Mady Christians, and Lucia Watson. I know. Uh, maybe it's a coincidence, but Whitfield Connor, who played the lead opposite you as Jim in our story today, also played the same theaters over the country in Hamlet about two weeks after your show and left each city. Oh, really? And in every theater, he was assigned the same dressing room you had. But how did he know that? Because you had written Anne Blythe, Watch on the Rhine, 1942, <laughs> on every dressing room wall. Look what I saved as my own press agent. <laughs> I did enjoy working with him here. Uh, then you came to Hollywood? Yes, but my first big break came when I was cast as the wicked daughter in Mildred Pierce. She was a brat, but you'll always be remembered for that fine portrayal. Thank you. Now, tell us about your latest picture from Universal International. This one is in Technicolor a western called Red Canyon with Howard Duff and George Brent. It had its premiere last month in Salt Lake City. I've read some of the nice reviews about Red Canyon, and I'll be sure to watch for it. You do that, C.P., and I hope you like it. Now, who's playing here with you next week? Next week, Anne, and ladies and gentlemen, that capable and beautiful star of the European continent and the United States stage and screen, Alona Massey, will join us in a romantic adventure as the lady from Luxembourg. This is the story of new world love and old world customs that come into natural conflict with Dan Cupid winning the final and most important round. Oh, that sounds wonderful. I'll be listening. Goodbye, C.P. Goodbye, Anne. Be sure to join us next week, ladies and gentlemen, when we bring you Alona Massey and the Lady from Luxembourg. Until then, thanks for listening, and cheerio from Hollywood. <laughs> Anne Blythe appeared through the courtesy of the Hollywood Coordinating Committee, which arranges for the appearance of all stars on this program. The script was by Bill Hampton, with music under the direction of Eddie Scrivana. This program is transcribed in Hollywood for release at this time. Wendell Niles speaking. <laughs>